All right, guys, welcome back to the Fitness in Philosophy podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about willpower and fitness. James, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm great, thank you. Um, I was just thinking, we could we change it to, maybe maybe it's just semantics, but willpower slash weak-willed. Yes, I was, uh, I was debating. Or what... is, it, is it the opposite? Is weak-willed the opposite of that? Like, I was trying to think of, you know, I wrote down will, will powerful slash weak willed. And that would kind of be like a right, left. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I was, uh, I was debating actually, I mean, the initial title for this was going to be, I was trying to figure out what Tate internets <laughs> was going to uh, you know, understand, but I mean, the actual term within philosophy, like if you look it up on Stanford encyclopedia is weakness of will. So I think weak willed is probably a better way to, yeah. Yes. The weak willed and fitness or the weak willed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, create that link as well. Cause uh, you did that for, uh, for SEP for another, I forget the other area that I went to, but it was really well uh, discussed. It was lengthy, but it was well, well discussed. <clears throat> yeah. The, yeah. Just for anyone who's curious uh, in case you haven't heard us reference this before Stanford encyclopedia philosophy, great free resource online very well done um yeah and you certainly don't need to read the entire thing it's nice that you can kind of like jump to different sections but if you're curious about like diving in on anything deeper it's it's really quite a good resource yeah what i kept going on that too uh the last time i was there and you know if you just uh if, with that information right if you're capable of reading you know all you would need i think to, correct me if i'm wrong you know to get to a, a great understanding beyond just the text right is to have like 12 people and do like a book club thing where you guys all read it, maybe read it together or like go through the information. And then they just have this hours and hours long back and forth on different things. I think a way to learn those things. I mean, and that's, you know, back to our point of it's not that it's not that costly for that. You know, all you need is a couple hours and some time dedicated to it. But SEP, I thought I thought of that. I was like, geez, you just had like four or five people like-minded wanted to get, you know, leveled up, not to an area that where they're going to teach that particular thing, but to a level up is understanding. Just read through those, get four or five other people, discuss it in a room, you know, for a couple hours. What did you think? What's your thoughts on that? How did you carry this over to different aspects of life and what we're doing for fitness, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, if that's a, uh, even if it's not an invitation, but if it is a potential invitation in the future for an OPEX, uh, philosophy book club I'm, I'm, I'm down down to climb. yeah yeah i think uh i might be down for that one for sure <laughs> uh but you're right i mean a lot, a lot of these articles too they um well, this is indirectly a book club you know if you want to think about it you know i mean there's no sometimes there's no book essentially on willpower but you know you we take information from willpower and philosophy of that that you've extracted and understood and like collected and we're putting it into text in this audio form so it is it's kind of that that is one of the other nice things too is that you know within um philosophy there are kind of two ways to approach things there's kind of the primary sources which uh you know are kant and aristotle and all these things where they talk on so many different topics but you get kind of a sense of their view and then the scp and other secondary sources too they'll synthesize like all that ancient and all that modern information into like willpower or like yeah, yeah. virtue or uh, liberty. So it's a nice kind of primer on these topics without feeling like, oh my God, unless I read, you know, Kant's critique of pure reason, which is like 800 pages, like I can't, you know, jump in. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, by the way, for those who don't know, one of the uh, goals of this podcast is to eventually lead to a um, non biological fitness. They already have a fitness entry in SCP for biology. We are going to see if we can eventually. Mm -hmm. We had talked at one point about seeing if we can get a fitness yeah. entry for uh, physical fitness. So yes. We'll yes. Philosophy of physical fitness. Yes. We're going to say it over and over. Yeah. <laughs> and think We're of us. Ask the universe for it. Manifest it. Yes. Yes. So in previous, episode, we, in previous episodes, we've talked about a lot of different ways that... Um, you could characterize philosophy um, and, you know, there, there are tons of different ways we've talked about, you know, philosophy as asking the question, what is the nature of things? 
the Wilfred Sellers question, how do things in the broadest sense of the term hang together in the broadest sense of the term, assumption questioning, intellectual combat, appearance versus reality. But I think another way that's relevant to what we're discussing today is philosophy sees some weird phenomena in the world, something that's like, oh, wait, why is that happening? And then ask questions about it. Now, obviously, science does that too, and history. And so philosophy does this with a certain subset of particular things. But to take one example from a previous episode we've done, would be disagreement. You know, how is it that people disagree if they're exposed to the same evidence? What do we do if people disagree? Like, how do we make isn't sense? Isn't that of interesting? That? <laughs> yeah, isn't that interesting? Like, isn't that weird? What are they disagreeing about? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. And how, how is it that two rational or multiple rational agents could be exposed to the same evidence and come to different conclusions? Yeah. So, to give people kind of an entree to today's topic. Uh, it's a very famous topic within philosophy. It goes all the way back to Plato and Socrates and probably long before in terms of people thinking about it, but not having like formally written it down or at least surviving the ages to us, uh, is this notion of like willpower, weakness of willed, or what is called in the Greek, and apologies to any ancient philosophers where I'm butchering this term, uh, akrasia, uh, so weakness of will. So here's the blatant fact people seem to act against their better judgment or interests all the time. Like this is as pervasive a feature as you could get. And it's especially relevant in the fitness and health realm. So the central question is, how is it possible that one could act contrary to one's better judgment? How is it that someone, you know, a being that is capable of rationality and judgment and weighing different things against each other could possibly ever act against their own interest? And as we'll talk about, Socrates and others famously said they can't. What they do is them thinking that's the best judgment. And that, that mm. comes with its own benefits and drawbacks, but that's, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, could you give me, could you give me a, um, I was hoping you can give me an example of like older writings or older texts in which uh, like older philosoph philosophers way back would use as like an example, like a day-to-day -day example that they would use to say, this is what explains the notion of what I'm trying to question here in terms of willpower. Could you give an example of that? Like, it was was it was it simply uh, they would talk about like would it enter into psychopathy like neurosis or perversions or or you know schizophrenia or I guess this is I guess this wouldn't be back to uh, Socratic times. But does anything come to mind as to what you remember? Use they use as an example of like man man climbs mountain but he knows it's hot outside and it's very challenging, but he still, what's, what's, what's up with that? No, that's, that's a really good question. I, uh, no, I should go back and look. And surprisingly, I don't remember seeing an example listed or the Socratic variety in um, the article, but yeah, I should go back and look in the Republic or uh, elsewhere to see. Um, no, but that's a really good point. Um, I do remember from, Kant, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's a similar thing. And it starts to, it's where you kind of start to get the proto versions of neurosis yeah. um, or the discussion of it. So Kant famously asks about like some of his mentors and people he admires, like, how could you ask these somewhat like nonsensical questions about the world? Like questions that when you delve deeper about it, like it doesn't really make sense. And he says, well, it's just a natural propensity of reason to ask these questions and you kind of have to self-correct. So that's kind of like the proto version of what we eventually get to with, um, with some of the discussions around weakness of will, where it's like, it's a natural propensity of the body to want to do X, Y, or Z. And then the mind needs to kind of pull, pull things back a little bit. Yeah. 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 The, uh, and for the topic today, I'm excited to discuss that too, around where, um knowledge comes in to that point because even if you if you were to slow down really slow on the words of what you said for better judgment you know well we, we're going to talk about today like how do you decide what is better and how come someone doesn't know what better is um but maybe because of their perception they think it's better and so how do we contend with that you know with the with the decisions that are in front of us and um yeah i'm excited to discuss that because to say it, to say it, I guess in a layman's terms, um, which you're gonna you're gonna set up and say it again, but um, like people, people, a lot of individuals know what you know what what would be better, maybe, <laughs> but but they don't act upon that, 
And so here is the, here's the rub for today to philosophize over this as to where it comes from and why it's not the case in the majority of cases, why, why it is. And then, uh, yeah, we'll play. I like that angle. I like the angle because we're, we're coming about this same indirect area, right. Of intentions and actions and, and behaviors for people, but we're coming about it, asking a different question, a different through line. Uh, so I, I like that. Yeah, me too. So here are some useful examples from the SCP article that I've kind of, I filled in with, I mean, in the SCP article, they use like A and B. So I figured it'd be useful to just use some more concrete examples of what someone might pick. But here, here are some examples of things that aren't puzzling versus something that is puzzling. So let's say Julie decides to buy a Mac over a PC, even though she knew a Mac was more expensive. That's not a confusing choice. Macs are better computers, objectively. Um, <laughs> And overall, this is important for her life and workflow. So nothing's nothing's confusing about that. Uh, you know, Jimmy opted for pepperoni pizza over steak and vegetables, even though he knew steak and vegetables was healthier. You know, it was Jimmy's birthday, and he realized that all things considered, one night wasn't going to, you know, was worth the health trade-off for the taste. Now, here's the puzzling one. Joseph decided to count blades of grass for the rest of his life as the main thing he wanted to do, as opposed to being a doctor, which he knows being a doctor is the best thing for him, all things considered. This phrase, if you go to the SCP article and just read the literature on it, this is really the, the key phrase here, all things mm -hmm. considered. So this decision seems genuinely perplexing. Why all things considered would someone go against their better judgment? So the all things considered makes it so that like, yeah, okay, the Mac is more expensive, but for my workflow and for, you know, such and such, it's worth it. So like when, when you weigh everything all together, it's like, oh, well, that really isn't my better uh, interest. But when you have the all things considered, it means, no, no, you really have evaluated everything and you're choosing the thing that is lesser for you, that does not go along with your long-term life plans or commitments or intentions that's the part that for philosophers has been really perplexing. How is it that a rational agent could do such a thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one immediate reply that one might have, and we'll talk about this down below. And of course, you know, back in Socrates and Plato time, they didn't have evolutionary biology and they had sort of, you know, different metaphors for kind of accounting for this, the charioteer, but like one easy way in a certain sense to account for this from an evolutionary biology perspective is prefrontal cortex was the last thing to develop, right? Mm -hmm. We are inherently, you know, we, we have certain drives as biological beings and the uh, prefrontal cortex is the proverbial person on top of the elephant, you know? So it's, it's, it's not that confusing actually, mm -hmm. this isn't uh, a problem, but you know, I, I, think, I think there is, there's a genuine question to be asked here um, about how that could happen, how rationally, you know, it, to take a fitness and health example, how someone could set the intention to um, be healthy and live a long life or to do sustainable activity or to refrain from certain foods. And then in the moment when they very well know they shouldn't be doing it according to their own stuff, not according to someone else. Mm -hmm. they, they don't ask that, so. Yeah, I think of the, I love the word puzzling in there, you know, for our question for today, there's something puzzling about it, right? So, you know, uh, and I and I immediately thought, was there a point in time? And is, is it because of the example of of Joseph counting blades of grass? Was there a point in time where counting blades of grass, all things being considered, were more important than being a doctor? Right. I know that may sound crazy, but you know, I I, I then just thought of, is it is it is it really the current time and the culture that determines all things considered? So I, I thought of this continuum of like, if doctor is way over here, right? And we're considering it's the best thing for Joseph, right? And Joseph's oh, the best thing for me, you know, and can, counting blades of grass is here, you know, is there like this continuum of things that we get harder and harder to make this judgment around like, well, doctor versus, you know, that was connected somewhat to him being on the knees down with the blades of grass, you know what I mean? So is yeah. there possibly a horticulturist or something that it's like, right. you know, per square area, soil, you know, and that leads to this person, you know, discovering fucking reforestation problems, right? So it's like, right. so I, I thought about that. So is it really the, you know, i.e. a doctor 
in 2022 and et cetera, in current culture has a part to play with that. And that's what makes it perplexing. Uh, that's that's part of it. That's part of it. Um, yeah, no, when I actually, when I was trying to come up with that particular example, I was- I was Oh, you came up with that one? Yeah, like all, all the all the pizza and the Mac and PC and all that stuff, like all they had in the article was like A, B, D, E, like they didn't have actual like values oh, there. Oh, but the grades, Blades of Grass genius, right? Well, I wish I could it, take- It is the, no, but it does resemble the, like the simplistic notion, right? Uh, I'm seeing it that way anyways, the simplistic notion of what seems illogical, irrational, and perplexing and puzzling, right? But <laughs> outdoors, you know, I, I just think all those natural components of this that, that the, uh, I, I immediately bring up the, the, the individual uh, who's, who's doing these, what seemingly perceived to be useless things but it's, uh, it could be very valuable. So it's all based upon this perspective. So I'm not sure if you implemented the blades of grass counting as being that to challenge, uh, to challenge my notions on that for that continuum, but you did. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, partially in a certain sense. So this, this actually came from when I was a, when I, one of the first classes I was a teaching assistant for uh, in grad school called Morality and Modernity. And it was based a, a, a lot in, a lot of stuff that McIntyre writes mm. where, you know, he'll talk about, well, yeah, I mean, legally, you know, different strokes for different folks. We shouldn't arrest someone, you know, they can do whatever they want, but are we saying that human flourishing could really be achieved by someone counting just blades of grass for no particular end versus, yeah. you know, either raising a family or pursuing their passion or something like that. And, yeah. and we had lots yeah. of debates back and forth about this and yeah. uh, okay. um, <laughs> that's part of it. But then to, you know, to go back to your question, I think there are two separate questions, both of which are interesting. One is the question around like, how can society and culture influence what the person themselves is thinking about as valuable or not? That's a very interesting, yeah. important question. Yeah. But that one, I don't think is necessary for the weakness of will discussion. You can, you can just say like, whatever is considered, whether, you know, as long as it's a rational agent who is free and intentional, it's still puzzling why, according to their judgment, however they came to that judgment, whatever society said or culture said, why would they choose something contrary to what they thought individually? Oh, okay. Was, the, yeah. The, okay. Yeah. I, I get that's, it. Now. That's, what, that's Joseph, the, what Joseph thought. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's the central like puzzling bit, but, but I totally yeah. agree. There is a, there's a second question about like, how did Joseph even come to think that? Yeah, what society yeah exactly. Think? Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how did he come to think that all things being considered, he knows a doctor is what's best for him. Right. Yeah. So if we had to ask what is weakness of will, what, you know, what is acrasia acting freely and intentionally contrary to one's better judgment? How do you say that? I, I, I could totally be but butchering it here. So because dude, what... acrasia sounds so much better currently. <laughs> yeah, no, like, so that, I mean, that's, that's the way I used to pronounce it. I, I believe it. I believe it's, I mean, none of us had exposure to how ancient Greek is spoken. Of it's course, like the like, ACAI berry, right? My, I, I F that up every time my girls make fun of me for it. And I'm not going to say it here on the air, but uh, that's how I would pronounce that. Yeah. I, I believe, I believe it's acrasia. Like when I, when I've heard like acrasia, like a, like acrasia. the prefix, like mm -hmm. a, against, like, I think it's, and then crusia, I believe is will or is, so when, when I've heard it, spoken about i believe that's the correct pronunciation and of course my ancient philosophy friends will get on me for having butchered it but <laughs> it should be that little land piece that connects asia with alaska that's what they should have called that yeah yeah <laughs> that's we, what i we, see as soon as i see that i'm like yeah that's that little land piece we can just do the american pronunciation we can just do like you know cream brulee <laughs> acrasia <laughs> a whole other show robbie a whole other show <laughs> Really, <laughs> listen, dude. Metric system. And I'll just stop there. <laughs> truth, truth, totally true. So yeah, I mean, really, what this is is just acting freely and intentionally, contrary to one's better judgment. So what would not be a problem? Well, if you weren't acting freely and intentionally, like if someone was forcing you to, a dictator, or mind control, or drugs, or something like that, like that would not be puzzling. Um, but when you yourself weigh certain options on like a imaginary scale of weights and judge one thing to be better than the other 
for yourself and yet choose the thing that is not better, that's what's perplexing. What deter like what determines in in those conversations that you said started, I guess, there, uh, what determines or was it laid out clearly as like a step-by-step -step approach or some examples of what rational, what rationality was or what, what is rational to kind of weigh against these, you know? Um, so so if, the, if the charge is gonna be, oh, it's irrational, well then was it ever taken that stance where it's like, well, this is what rational is. So therefore what we see happening here, it's gotta be irrational. Was that ever taken? And what were those rational From thoughts? From what I'm remembering, and I'm actually, I think I'm starting to remember one of the central examples from Socrates okay. and ancient philosophy friends. Maybe Stephen that. Pinker's book is going to unfold that for me after I finish 800 pages of it. <clears throat> no, I mean, there's, there's been tons of discussion more recently about rationality and what it consists in. I mean, I think in a lot of ways for Socrates and Plato, like it had a lot more like... Um, evaluative oomph or heft to it, whereas today it can sometimes mean like someone is rational to the extent that they adopt the right means to achieve a particular end, whether that end is good or not. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was more yeah. like doing something in one's best interest. So yeah. to, get, to, give an, to give an example. What's best interest, I guess. Yeah. And, and best interests. Yeah. Again, like not necessarily mean like self-interested, but here's, no. here's an example that I think would highlight it. Um, someone uh you know, let's say there's a bitter medicine that's going to cure someone. So it's going to suck to take it, but you know, it's going to make you better. Well, according to your rational self-interest, like, and, you know, living a long time and making yourself healthier and what have you, um, the rational thing to do would be to take the medicine mm -hmm. and the irrational thing would be to let yourself perish because you don't want to deal with the better taste. So taking a, a stark example. Yes. That would be, yes. that would be although example. current indirectly. Yes. And you didn't throw that down for that reason, but <laughs> Yeah, what, which are the bitter pills that we need to uh, both metaphorically and literally yes, yes. take today? Yeah. Um, hashtag liver king. <laughs> <laughs> the liver pills. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Um, anyway, so, but yeah, the problem goes all the way back to- Dude, the, I uh, ate liver pills in the late 90s. It was by Beverly Hills uh, International. It was a supplement company. So if you want to want to predate it, it's one thing I didn't add to the conversation. Anyways- and they were horrendous and I didn't get bigger. No matter how yeah. much Charles told me I was gonna get bigger. You didn't get swolled out like the liver king. Oh, my, my, my gut and my butt took a, <laughs> took a, took a beating though <laughs> from the pills. <laughs> and, and, we'll, and we'll go back to the point to the topic at hand. <laughs> I may have pulled Robbie off. <laughs> we may have no. our first pause. <laughs> no, because now that that is a uh, that's a clip. So <laughs> my gut <laughs> <is> my <butt. laughs> and I'm gonna do it. With, I'm gonna do it without context. I'm gonna do it without mentioning the liver pills. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Talk about being sensational. That's yeah. our in. That's the way we're gonna get people in now. Yeah. What the I'm hell gonna... does that have to do with willpower? That's very yeah. rational. <laughs> that's perplexing. Why would you eat all those and you're not getting bigger? Hmm. That's what YouTube videos do, right? They, you know, so it's an hour and a half video and like, I'm going to put the gut in the butt thing as like the 30 second clip at the beginning. And that's, what's going to get the. Yeah. Well, we'll have data to see how long people stay on once they see. Exactly. <clears throat> so, okay. So uh, yeah, back to my, back to my point of the, uh, you know, what, what determines, what determines what rational was. So that was the best yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah, so it's a good question and there are lots of debates about it. I, I, I do think, yeah, back in the ancient philosophy context where this is discussed, I, I think there's a pretty easy common sense thing that we can all refer to about like, you know, the, the medicine one is, is kind of an easy one because it's a very stark case about like what would be in your best interests. Um, you know, uh, to take a modern example that they weren't aware of, but I think would be very much in the same vein, like the marshmallow test. You know, yeah. if you can wait 10 minutes for two marshmallows, yeah. uh, uh, you know, investing in mutual funds rather than, you know, throwing all your money in like Dogecoin. <laughs> you know what I mean, right. like that, yeah. that, 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 that type stuff where like, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're aware of the like, the sexy thing is over here, like tempting yeah. you to do otherwise, but it's potentially harmful, that type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And probably just with 
tremendous amount of experience, those, those were patterns that stood the test of time, regardless of cultural changes, right? It still was like this rational versus irrational pieces that were very clear. Yeah, and again, there's, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. There are these two questions, but like you can still, you can still have the weakness of will problem even throughout one's life as you get more experienced and better at judging what's better. Like you can still have, yes. so for example, like at 16, you can have the weakness of will problem where what you understand to be better maybe isn't the really better mm -hmm. thing that you understand at 36. Yeah. But you at that time think this is better and this is not, and you still yeah. choose this or not. We still yeah. have a problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all, I'm just trying to think of systems. It's like back and forth like this, but it goes higher. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, there's, there's intensity to both sides, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. So how do we okay. account for this? So, you know, in the, uh, in the SCP article, they talk about different ways um, to account for all. I'll talk really just about two of the main ones and then maybe uh, just kind of an evolutionary one. But famously, uh, Socrates and, you know, some modern philosophers, I mean, you want to talk about swallowing a bitter philosophical pill, say that this is impossible. It's genuinely impossible for someone to do one thing if she genuinely and in the fullest sense holds that she ought to do something else. It's, it, they almost consider it a contradiction in terms. Uh, so R.M. Hare, a famous uh, modern philosopher said, a person's, a person's evaluative judgments are infallibly revealed by her actions and choices. And, um, you know, just to give a little preview of a connection, we'll discuss it, you know, sometimes in, in OPEX or in these discussions, actions dictate priorities like what you do reveals what it is you prioritize and care about mm -hmm. yeah i i thought about uh daniel kahneman's work too with regards to uh i don't know if it's the same kind of direction in terms of like it's not truly a change in behavior it's just an awareness of what you're actually doing in your decision making that determines like what direction you're going to go I don't know if it's the same kind of same kind of idea, but um, yeah, could you could you replay that exact same thing again? Uh, sure, absolutely. Just for me, just for me. Thank you. How do we account for this? How do we account for this charge of irrationality, right? And yeah. Socrates and current readings of here would say that it's impossible for someone to do one thing if they hold that they ought to do something else? Um, yes, yeah. so basically the way they account for it is by saying that it doesn't exist. Like saying this phenomena that you think exists Got it. actually doesn't because, Got it. It, yeah, so it's to call the very phenomena into question. It's to say, right. you think this exists, you think this is a real thing oh, yeah. that someone would judge one thing to be better and then do something else. And they're saying, no, no, no insofar as they are doing that other thing yeah they judged the other thing to be better gotcha gotcha <laughs> now i totally get that because i use that a lot <laughs> in terms of common things that exist inside of fitness and i immediately didn't say it's the wrong question to ask because they don't exist <laughs> so just back up and be like well, what happens if they didn't exist <laughs> how are you getting to that point of rationality now if you go through that lens it's like oh yeah it does make no sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I got you now. That, yeah. Right. And it looks like we're going to have to change up all the OPEX behavior documents. <laughs> what no a big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Just another couple of years worth of work. Yeah. You know what we said? Wash that all. <laughs> so, I mean, of course, it doesn't mean like, you know, there still may, you know, just to make it clear here, like, and to even drop back to the health and fitness realm there may still be corrective work to be done there because you could say, oh, well, the corrective work isn't necessarily for someone to, the corrective work is now to help the person make better judgments. They just, they weren't informed enough or they didn't, you know, what, yeah. what have you. Um, so that's one way you could still have practical action there, but like, yeah, that's what we still do. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, I always told all my students, like any philosophical position always has trade-offs and, you know, positives and negatives and, things like that. The big old negative of this one, even though it does have some positives to it, is it seems to blatantly, blatantly contradict experience. I mean, just yeah. like, I mean, as, as, as starkly as you could possibly 
imagine. So a lot of philosophers have been trying to figure out like how to, how to account for this, how to give a better account of this. And one that I really liked was from uh, Holton, where he said, look, a lot of the problem with weakness of will comes from this notion of like, in the moment you're thinking this person is evaluating all the stuff about this one side and evaluating all the stuff about this other side and deciding, well, I'm going to do the thing that's not as good for me. And what Holton is saying is what really happens in life is a time delay with regard to intentions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not that in every moment you're you know, like, as you're eating the pizza, it's like, oh, well, you know, is this in line with my intentions? I mean, sometimes you do, but a lot of times it's you, a previous version of you set the intention, the long-term intention to have done so-and-so, such and such. And then in the moment, you know, that lapses. Um, so it's really not that there's a current judgment versus a current judgment. It's a current judgment versus a past judgment. Now yeah. that's a lot of issues and, you know, but it, I feel like that does, it, it has the virtue that it accounts for this very real thing that really exists that we all see with our own two eyes all the time. And it says it actually exists. And I do think it gets some of the flavor of um, like what is actually going on now drawbacks. Um, you know, well, it's still a question why, why does someone's current judgment conflict with their previous judgment and stuff like that, if, if that's truly their higher self. But, um, but that's, that's one potential solution to it. Yeah, I, uh, I think what, what I was thinking about there is also the uh, free will, you know, free will debates or free will semantics, free will definition. And, and going there is, I think, is a good base support to try to understand what I am seeing is these similar things, right? If it's illusion or if it's not, then just look at experiences today and it's, it's, you know, whether you do or do not have a choice and where those choices come from and is, is it the repetition of these patterns of things that led you to making those choices, et cetera. Like there's a, there's a lot that goes into that to what we see today. Like, like you said, experiences, like, gosh, <laughs> you could say that, but now, now, now let's be real. <laughs> let's talk about everything that happens day to day and what we see happen it, in my, I hold a lot of them in, in, you know, Anyways, I just hold a, a lot of those at the same time, and it helps me make sense of it when it comes down to coaching other people. Um, also, I thought about the development of this particular pattern, right? So, for example, if you're being just super simple with a specific choice that people have, and Rob, you can't see the screen, but Robbie was holding up one hand and holding up the other, it's like, well, I know this to be best, but this is what I'm performing. You know, you got to also say, well, you know, you have to take into consideration consideration the repetition and the development of making those decisions. That has a big part to play with it, right? So uh, I, I just keep thinking about the, the classic human behavior construct, right, of an organism doing a task, getting a feedback from that task, and then learning from that in order to do a new task, right? If that person does that particular thing and they get some kind of emotions or some kind of outcomes or something that fulfills those needs, you should obviously see regardless of what you think, that the next time this task comes up that's somewhat similar, it's a very simple decision to choose pizza over steak and vegetables, right? So it, it doesn't matter what you think in terms of rationality. It's we're not taking into consideration the individual differences for people in their development of these behaviors. I think in my, in my opinion, anyways, a lot of that has to be drawn out with people. And I'd like to be short with individuals when I meet them and get a sense making of like, you know, how are they going to take this point that I'm going to make here before I say, listen, you've had 30 years of twice a day of this repetition of this like pleasurable outcome that's irrational to both of us. Would you agree? <laughs> and I'm like, do you think that's just tomorrow? You'd be like, well, I'm just going to eat steak and vegetables. Yeah, you know, exactly. that, so that's the, this is the rub, right? On the tension around what, what, I know is like, dude, you know, that's just stupid. <laughs> you know, we were joking together about this, right? And I'm also preempting, <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but I'm preempting this sit down conversation. I do these pro bono pieces all the time to kind of get in the trenches with like the, let's call them the hardest case possible individuals. Wow. I just met this gentleman in hockey, great person, but he's like the classic question, right? Oh, I want to come to your gym so you can help me out. I'm like, okay, come on over. <laughs> and I want to... <laughs> So you're even laughing with it, right? It's like, okay, good one. <laughs> you're walking into the... <laughs> Anyways, 
but I, but I, it, it makes me appreciate, right. It makes me appreciate how this individual, like how I can work on my skills, my sense making of like what into bring it back to this point, right. What is clearly irrational pieces that this person is participating in that they very well know, right. So, you know, is it weak willed or is it a willpower issue in terms of the choices they want to make going forward? And then how do I go about doing that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would, I would literally, I would pay a very large sum of money <laughs> to watch you do one of these pro bono cases, like, like Morpheus and Neo, just like obliterating, like, just tell me, Neo, do you believe in free will? No, why not? <laughs> Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. And just like, oh, I think what would be even more appropriate is to do a spoof version of it, like Jimmy on the street. Like, honestly, go back that way where, where we actually have this real time scenario built yeah. up, you know? Um, anyways, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. I mean, I, I, I really enjoy this individual. Um, really great story uh actually as well um and uh anyways you know you and i can talk offline about it but but it is going to take into this consideration right it, it, i'm going to make some assumptions but there's going to be a ton of things right where in both him and i coming together as one like mind on this particular area where we're both going to agree yeah i do these things over and over and I'm not sure what the problem is, right? Again, this comes back to our point. It's perplexing to me, right? right? And that's what he will say, right? And so I think that's the that's the growth in this conversation and us bringing it up is like, we need to discuss, you know, how to find this, this fine balance between, you know, uh, is, is, it, is it this, you know, choice-making repetition and the awareness of the choice-making repetition um, is it the cultural things? Like you said, it has one part to play with it. Possibly is it the cultural things being aware of that? Is it like, is it truly just for this individual, uh, choices and behaviors and habits under this rational, you know, template and framework, right. And how to get people there, you know, and I think it's a 36 step program, right. It's not a, it's not a 12 step program. It's a 36 step program. Um, anyways, Sorry to continue on with that, but I'm excited no, no, I, about that. No, I totally agree. And I think, um, I mean, there's a lot to be gleaned from that related to our discussion where, you know, one of the, one of the tasks of philosophy that I was mentioning earlier is this notion of like assumption questioning. So one of the, sometimes when you have these philosophical problems, a useful thing to do is to question some of the assumptions behind them. So yeah. one of the ones I always used to question when I ran into this is like, wait, this is a legitimate question. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, you know, it, it only becomes a legitimate question when you view rationality in such a strong way. And this is a debate between like Kant and Hume about like, how much does rationality play a role in human life? And I would argue that with psychology and evolutionary biology, we've come to realize like rationality is like a nice little garnish on top of what is otherwise habits and, you know, psychological rewards for sugar and dopamine and yeah. you know, sex and yeah. other things. And the idea that you would just be like, oh, this is the better thing for you to do. And you should just go do that when you have all these things just like tugging in the other direction, uh, whether they're drives or years having done it or habits, like is just, wait, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. So I think one of the ways you could push back against the very question itself is to say, this is only so puzzling when you assume that humans are predominantly rational. It becomes so puzzling when you assume that even if we are rational, that if we just know something, we're immediately going to be able to instantiate it in our lives without having to, you know, repeatedly correct that behavior. And that's where that notion of like neurosis, uh, repetitive correction comes in. Like it's not, it's not sufficient to say the thing. It's not enough to know I should be eating broccoli when Doritos are pulling you in the other direction for 20 years. Like mm -hmm. you need to constantly correct that in order to uh, address that drive and in a straight up knife fight between reason and emotion emotion will always win the only way to defeat that is you know rationality be a habit 
yes constant yeah practice yeah because yeah, what you're doing there that's what i mentioned in just in systems the way i think is like the task and then there's feedback and then there's this new task there has to be some kind and i think that's the chink right that happens when we're talking about this the system that's going like this and now we're asking whoa you know is this willpower or weak willed right based upon that thing that happened i think when there's a feedback loop in there i.e coach fitness enthusiast fitness activist whatever that's that's the one that that's the person or the thing that provides the feedback loop that was not that was not there prior and that, that's what creates quote unquote this little like chink in the in the in something right so it doesn't just pleasure pain pleasure pain you know it's like boom you know uh how how did that go uh you know uh i've never been asked the question before okay great that's the first chink in it is just the questioning of the you know the awareness of that particular thing right uh do it three times again right uh pizza you know noon time on tuesdays right and i've asked you the third time now it's the third tuesday and now you're like you know what now that you've asked me back to that awareness piece, I'm above awareness. And now I'm like, you know what? I'm a little gassy for a couple hours after, right? So that's the, that's the, you know, the little second chink in the quote unquote, the feedback, right? To come back and to start that. So what you described as that circle going round and round, I, I think that's where we come in to, to provide just more, more judgment to that, you know? Otherwise we're just like, putting up memes and symbols and being like, uh, you know, uh, broccoli on top space Doritos under <laughs> just get on with it, you know? Right. Yeah. But yeah. Raising that collective, uh, awareness, you know, it's like the first some time someone does a budget or a food journal or a food move poop journal, or, you know, I, I know there are problems about this and we've talked about it, but like, you know, a CGM or, you know I mean? Just something yeah. where it's like, Oh shit. My blood sugar just went to 200 like yeah. whoa yeah. i i can't feel my mit mitochondria acting in such a such way i can't feel my neurons dying off but like oh mm -hmm. i see that you know what i mean like yes. again and higher order and lower order versions of these things and not everyone's the best but like bringing more awareness to something that was like oh i didn't realize that was going on yes so yeah yeah some kind of feedback so that was weakness of will in philosophy now let's talk a little bit more about it in fitness. So in a lot of ways, you know, as we've kind of discussed, the entire health and fitness industry <laughs> revolves around the following two things. How is it, the question, how is it that a client can want a particular health and fitness goal and consistently act against that goal? Um, that's one question. And then how can we as coaches and trainers help clients move past those situations and act more in line with their highest intentions and you know i'm sure you've heard this too james and i've I, I can't even count how many times i've heard it and i'm sure other coaches have heard it like i know what i need to do i just need to put it in action like i know mm -hmm. well so what's stopping you know what i mean like that's yeah. that's the question we all like so what's stopping you but yeah we all know that it, it's not it's not that simple if it were like you know it would have been done already so um so i guess the first question to maybe start off with and we've talked about this a little bit before and discussed it but i think it's maybe worth coming back to do you feel that this weakness of will issue is the primary reason in health and fitness people don't do what they should, or is it nefarious actors or lack of knowledge or combination, or what, what do you think there? Yeah, the, the first thing I think about was back to your point on, again, comes back to just honoring experiences or what we hear in the trenches, also being aware that our bubble and our environment is not a reflection of what goes on everywhere. So as a generalized statement, to answer your question, I think, I think that is the case uh, where, to use what you said, uh, I do know what to do, but there's something impeding on me going about doing that. And I think those words are really, um, you know, need to be blown up and extracted, right? I know what to do. No means that, you know, I, 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 with the general assumption I'm making, a lot of people do have knowledge of what would be best for them in health and fitness and practices around that. Now, with regards to it being, and I like your words of the, uh, you know, um, is it the irrationality and or unknowable charge for that? Um, I don't know. I sit, I definitely sit more on the fence of, uh, and I'm pausing here just to make sure I have a, you know, the if if because I repeated it so often, I do feel, I do feel strong when I make that statement on it 
uh, but that it's the, the, the knowledge is out there and has been out there for a long period of time. And it's not that complex and it's amongst all of us. And I, I think it's kind of just a, uh, it's um, through a number of generations now, let's just call it, let's just use the date timeline. If, if fitness really boomed and like, you know, like a Moore's law kind of exposure went way, way up in like, notoriety and like existence in the 60s and 70s, let's say, and 80s with academia and investigation piled on science and academia and investigation piled on 80s, 90s, implementation of uh, the functional fitness prior to the invention of the inter interwebs, et cetera. It was like, woof, you know, so I, it's very hard for me to, uh, to be okay with the fact when someone says who is who is older than 16 today. Um, I don't know what to do. I just, I just, uh, that's my general sentiment on that. So I think people know what to do. Um, and I think that's where we may want to spend a little time on is like, well, you know, how, how come, you know, is, is it, is it the, is it the lack of knowledge, the accessibility to knowledge? And, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I don't want to move directly onto another point, but, uh, I do want us to discuss also my uh, my my uh, awareness of people, you know, and this what I see anyways is that there's not a lot of there's not a lot of inspiration around people reaching for their highest potential today. I, I really think a lot of humans leave a lot on the table, um, and and there's good there's there's really good reason for people not to go or get go towards their highest potential there's there's lots of good reason for them to not do that today so i think that's where i also want to lead the conversation to say that like if if you know we we all really got behind with this good positive intention and therefore it knocks over any nefarious actions right this real positive intention of like we're all okay with the fact that uh you know, education is in place to raise everyone's brains, right? So that we are all individually, cognitively as strong as possible. And we all positively get behind this physical expression, potential positive thing, just to put it into two, bu two buckets. You know, I, I don't think we'd even be discussing, you know, those things because people would really be striving all the time for their maximum potential, right? But I don't think there's a need for it today. I don't think a lot of people have to go after their highest potential. Therefore, you can see it works backwards to, you know, people may know, but I think deep down, many, 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 many individuals are like, but why? Why do that? Right? I know steak and vegetables are better, but why should I do that? Yeah, so that's where I think to answer your question lengthily, I think generally i think people know but there's just a bunch of different things on the other side of that or the decision making process and i think one of them is the main is we don't need to we don't necessarily need to uh, today <clears throat> yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of truth in that i mean although it's interesting to ask like even from an evolutionary perspective even in the past like to what extent did people need to reach their highest potential even to like build a house or procure do you know what i mean procure food something like that yeah, like for sure that, that, made, that made me think of today like could someone still want to do the basic things for their health even without trying to reach their highest potential um yeah. but you're right i mean well, i in, think in there's a, something then that you could throw in that a lot of people over time have thrown in right whatever you want to call it um uh and i'm not i'm i don't if it, if it goes that way i'm fine with it but you got to have i think there, because to answer your question, I think there was points in time where there was the classic, uh, uh, you know, philosopher home builder, <laughs> you know, like they, where they were, whether they knew it or not, they were constantly recognizing this learning and adaptation process, right, uh, of like doing what is in front of them and thinking like challenging notions and challenging thought all the time that blended really well with what I'm using as the style of building a home. and. And, you know, 
I think whether whether it was or or not, people had this this uh, image of this beacon of the highest maximum potential for humans. And I think it did happen many, many years ago. Uh, you know, pro I probably maybe around, you know, dare I say, I don't know, civilization's birth or, you know, when agriculture, you know, just you give some point in time. So um, I think it did, Robbie. Uh, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just guessing, but I think it did. I think we, we were at that point in time you know, stressing for, you know, maximum potential of the recognition of this brain and this body. And just like every day, just like, wow, you know, this is fascinating. I got thoughts. Holy cow. How do I like continue to, to, you know, continue to grow those thoughts? That's why I call the philosopher. Right. And then the, the body, right. It's like, holy cow. You know, I built this little thing, birdhouse. Now I'm, I built a, a cow house. <laughs> and then I built a human house, like, but in, in all the physical things that go into that is the body. Right. And, and I really do think that, um, you know, over time, again, this, it, you know, it's that well, I talk about all the time, that evolutionary mismatch, right. It's like, we have the ability to like really grow that thing and to really grow this thing. Right. And, and I mean, growth in terms of like constantly striving for maximum potential, right. Without overreaching. Um, so I think there was a point in time, but I don't think it's, a, I don't think it is anymore. Hmm. Yeah, it certainly could be. I mean, yeah, that's, that's where, you know, studying the history of it, you know, could be beneficial. I mean, I, I think part of it is, you know, growing this potential, meaning the brain potential has finally gotten to a point in history where it actually yields crazy amount of return, so to speak, compared to what it used to in the past and growing the physical part of the body doesn't the same way um, yes. it used to. Um, yeah. And, you know, talk about evolutionary mismatch. That's, that's one of the kind of paradoxes of evolution, right? Is like, we want as a species to make things more efficient, but then yeah, as it adapt. become more, yeah. yeah. And yeah. now here we are, you that's know, right. famine. I mean, of course, like, let, let's not say absolutely without exception, but like, compared to all of human history, famine, for the most part, relatively speaking, has been dramatically reduced and yes. infant mortality and blah, 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 blah. Um, but now we don't have to work as hard. Yeah, yeah. And this, and this is the, this may seem like a small topic, but it's a big topic. It, it, well, I should back up. For me and my brain and my thoughts, I think this is the essential topic. This is the essential topic is that uh, we, we have to find a connector, right? We have to find a connector, in my opinion, to inspire people to move towards their highest physical and cognitive potential. Full well knowing, full well knowing that it actually, you know, a lot of people are okay with the mediocre, with mediocrity, right? And a lot of people are okay. And I, I should probably shouldn't use that word, but I don't care. A lot of people are okay with it. And there's been a lot of experience, evidence, let's say, of people doing mediocre things for 85 years, right? And that is well considered a living long and prospering. You see what I'm saying? So it's, I don't know, it's a, it's going to be, it's going to be a rough, it's going to be, in my opinion, anyways, it'll be a rough situation for a whole ton of coaches to try to get people to move towards that quote unquote awareness, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Because it's so hard to say, it's so hard to teach someone that I remember my 36 step program, right? It's like, wow, that's, that's a lot of work. And I can see how coaches can get extremely exhausted by step seven, because there's just so many impeding things that prevents that person from keeping going, right? Because steps 10 to 23 are the hardest, right? It's always the middle road ones are the hardest where they have to embody that and like, move through it and make their own decisions and like holy cow i couldn't believe that i was making that weak will decision many times you know it's so rational for me to be being consistent in my exercise you know uh anyhow i think it's a big thing which makes the yeah. topic fantastic today just as a as a through line to that same big question in my opinion yeah and i mean i can definitely see how having a beacon or an inspiration could help you know, guide folks a bit more. I think a question I would have there is like maybe in addition to that, just saying like, 
hey, even if someone doesn't want to reach for their highest potential, even if a human just wants the basics of like, I've had clients ask me like, Robbie, what are just like the general, you know, essentially the BLGs, like what are the basics a human needs to do? Yeah. To just like not feel like dog shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, even if you didn't have a beacon, like, oh, eat three square meals a day, you know, drink yeah. this water, go to bed yeah. on a regular time. Like, even if you're not looking to be like the best of the best of the best, like what are these basic things that you could yeah. do? Yeah. Well, I guess this is just a language of semantics because I consider consistency in the basics, the beacon. Yeah, like that, and I just use the word perfection, right? Perfection is consistency of the basics. So that is the beacon. That's the golden. The golden. Oh, and I mean, that, that I can get on board with. I guess I was just trying to say like, one could do all those things and yet fail to reach their highest physical potential. I mean, they could still be at a, at a good, you know, they could still reach a good level of physical health, mental well-being, but without being like, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does make sense. But in my brain, it's arguable because uh, I could certainly invoke uh, the uh, like language and knowledge like the, you know, Rocky that's coming to see me on Wednesday uh, that will get him so inspired around going after full physical potential because of that base support of the consistency, golden, golden things. Gotcha. So I think it can be structured for physical potential, you know, and I, I, we'll see, we'll see how it goes over time. You know, um, I don't even know why I'm, you know, questioning. I mean, I've, I've done, I've done this thousands of times. So it's, it's just like, it's just refining the language to be able to speak to people, to get them to understand that to your point, consistency, you know, is the beacon. And, uh, and then, you know, it's this feedback loop inside of these consistent framework that is going to allow you to go, Oh, you know, got to make a better judgment. Don't worry. Next time, whoop, you know, it just reverts it. And inside of that, Robbie's what I'm saying is that they're still, they're, they're still going to be downloading the things that are needed to keep striving towards this concept, right? Like that I'm going to somehow put in language to make him realize like there is a, there is a better you in there, right? Over the next five years. And then guess what? 20 years down the road, there's still a somewhat version of a better you that's there. And I want you to constantly keep trying to move towards that, right? And I'll, I'll be able to give you stuff to make you know that when, you're, when you think you're here or when you're above it, right, based on my experiences or what I've done with other people and overreaching or moving them past that, I'll also give you things to know when you're, you know, pushing too fast, too hard to, you know what I'm saying? So I think I can, you know, create that language to help him on that. But I don't know what's your thoughts on the. Do you think the the potential thing has a has a uh, has a big part to play with this conversation? Like like the lack of conversation on the potential, or what's your what's your thoughts on that? And just approaching potential as like a that comes into the conversation. I think it definitely. I mean, I think it definitely plays a part. I think a lot of it, like I said, comes back to the fact that unlike our entire human history where developing one's physical potential did ha did pay some major dividends either in terms of work or building a house or developing things we have reached you know this blip turning point in human history where like you know now all of a sudden literacy and cognition which were very few and far between before like literacy and like philosophy this was like very much the exception rather than the, yes. the rule and now like you know STEM and all these other things, you know, for better and worse, depending on how you look at it, do lead to, you know, better financial outcomes or, again, we can, we can have philosophical discussions about like yeah. whether it should be viewed as, but, you know, in terms of someone seeing their life prospects, I do think, you know, someone does not view developing physical potential in any way, anywhere the same way as they do developing their mental potential. Yeah. Um, I definitely I, think I, I said that before many times, we're in a cognitive we're in cognitive times. Yeah. I definitely, I think we both agree that lack of knowledge isn't the main thing. I, you know, I would definitely say, and, you know, I, I could be wrong, but I would imagine like when I would imagine you might agree to a certain extent, like when people say they know, like broad strokes, very broad yeah, strokes, like, for sure. okay, for I should sure. be eating broccoli rather than Doritos. I should be drinking water rather than soda. And then we got to get down yeah. to a little bit more nitty gritty, but like broad strokes, I should be yeah. walking that that type stuff yeah um i mean i think a lot of it has very little to do with with knowledge i think it really is the 
I, I think a huge part of it is our own evolutionary drives that led us to create these things and now drive throughs everywhere, cheap and accessible food. Um, TikTok, yeah. Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, right? Yeah, all, Modernity all, all, with like, you know, uh, you know, 16 to 45 year olds uh, really, you know, having to share the fact of what they're doing, right? That has a, that has a part to play with it as well, you know, in decision-making. It's almost like this, you know, this, this other factor that comes into it, you know, prior to let's call it 1895, let's say if there was fitness then, um, or actually we should use even like 1996, it'd be perfect because, you know, in, in suburb, suburban Arkansas, um, they couldn't, they couldn't share with anyone besides their local community through the local newspaper, right. As to what, what Johnny football star was up to, you know? Um, but now, you know, Johnny, as he's aged and now Johnny is like 39, you know, he's had, you know, 20 years of this uh, experience inside of, you know, the attention economy platform, which does, you know, whether we like it or not, um, have a part to play with and adds to what you just said earlier, right. Of the, all the things that lead to this, no, let's call it knowledge confusion, <laughs> you know, or yeah, what to do, what to do. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what then, to do. And those, like, again, we are the very same humans that, you know, have this evolutionary history that then created that, like the, uh, you know, the plus side of all that was, yeah, you know, Johnny had a close knit, you know, uh, social circle and whatnot, but the downside was religious dogmatism, political ignorance, racial ignorance, like, a whole slew of things. So now we get this exploded consciousness and like, oh, wait, you mean other people have to deal with this? You know what I mean? Like yeah. a lot of that, and yeah. some good, some bad. And then like, uh, but then you get the flip side of it with the close knit circle where it's like, uh, you know, kids are uh, playing alone with one another. Do you know what I mean? Like one's on their phone and the other's on their phone as they're playing with each other and um, that, 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 that type thing. So yeah, the uh, it's I I've been the it's been some powerful words you've used in here that I'm gonna gonna spend a couple seconds on here too is the uh, you said there's a strong countervailing force in the opposite direction, you know and and uh, again to finish with your point, I'm always careful when we say this you know our time is special but never in human experience right I don't know where those countervailing forces are extremely powerful and are non-stop I mean, and we created them oh it's yeah not, it's not anyone else like i we, know yeah evolutionarily we created them yes we drove ourselves to yes. this point it wasn't yes. some spirit or demon or other yeah you know, supernatural yeah. force it was us yeah so it, it should make sense right it should make sense that uh a you know a lot of people are going to make you know uh, sense of this fact that there's this massive void of purpose and meaning in some way, shape, or form. And then number two, uh, filling that void is going to make this big, hairy question with like, is it willpower or weak willness <laughs> that, that is causing the problem? You know, it should, it should just be, anyways, it's, it's, it's uh, strengthening the awareness for both you and I and other coaches to recognize and and make language to the issues that people are going to have to deal with when they want to make these steps towards better health, right? There's going to be a mass, and, and this hopefully these conversations can help coaches and other people, maybe even people who are participating in fitness, recognize that we understand, we get it. Like there's a, there's a ton of, to your point, countervailing forces. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it goes back to the environment. I mean, from a literal, just like physical world perspective, it is now fundamentally far more easy to slip up, so to speak, health and fitness wise than it has ever been in human history. And it's far harder to stay on track. Whereas the exact opposite was true, right? Like mm -hmm. if you wanted to make a cake, like baking is a relatively recent invention, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of like refined flour and refined sugar, like that was a pretty hard thing to do. You had to expend a bunch of effort and now the ratios are totally flipped. And from an evolutionary perspective, what we are supposed to do is conserve energy, maximize efficiency to do the, the thing with the least resistance. And yeah. that, you know, that used to be the things that we were doing that were health promoting. And now it's the things we are doing that um, 
are not health promoting and it's actively harder and there are actively more things pulling us in the other direction than there ever were in history. Yeah. So it should make sense when you hear people promoting, you know, fasting or meditation or, uh, you know, uh, cognitive, you know, be, be a tech savant, right? You, it, it should make sense that people are going to promote that. But, you know, I think they are, in some cases, they're nefarious uh, actors in there if they also don't talk about physical potential. That's where, that's where I think we come in to say, no, there is a second arm to this, right? So if you're going to make mention of those things, right, and you can show evidence and et cetera, all based upon its improvements for things, then what, what are actually people doing in human physical action, you know, um, alongside that, alongside this, you know, uh, higher order life that you think people are going to lead, lead with, uh, you know, with the, with the classic biohack, current biohack terminology, right? Um, I, think, I think those who come into that conversation and they talk a big talk with all those biohacking ideas, but then they also lend some conversation to now exercise and what you do physically has a part to play with this too. Then I can listen to that, right? I can listen to that um, in regards to trying to find some, you know, trying to find this middle ground, right? Okay, it's modern times and this is what we have available and this is what people say, right? You know, where does, again, where does, where does, the, phys where, where does the physical come in? you know, the conversation on that and striving for physical potential and et cetera. Um, yeah. And my belief, my, my personal belief that, that, that will do, that will heal a lot of things. If we continue to push towards striving for the consistency of physical potential, where it may, you know, spit out all these other clear thinking thoughts, changes in patterns of behavior and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that could be an either, or maybe, maybe that's conversation for you and I another time, but no, I think that's a good point. I mean, one other topic that I know we've talked about in the past that I think is especially relevant to this that I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, the question that I'm sure a lot of coaches have on their mind about like, you know, what role does a coach play here? What role should a coach play here? You yeah. know, should it be something that the individual can fix themselves? Is it something that, you know, uh, a coach can be useful for? I mean, I think, in, you know, you and I have, have gone back and forth on this and I think a lot well, there's a lot of agreement on a lot of stuff but I think for me one of the reasons why a coach becomes more and more necessary and of course if someone doesn't need it and they can do it on their own great cool uh, you know <laughs> no problem there but like I think one of the reasons why it becomes more and more necessary today is because of all these extraordinarily strong countervailing forces that are not going away in fact they are only going to get more pronounced as humans get more efficient as it becomes easier and easier and easier to you know get access to junk food you know it doordash didn't exist 20 years ago now do you know what i mean like yeah. it's only going to get easier to not exercise it's only going to get easier to eat junk food yeah uh, it's only going to get easier to stay up late at night and all the more reason why sometimes even though the knowledge exists and for those who can instantiate it great go do it yeah <laughs> for those who can't or have problems with the countervailing forces having a partner or a coach who can help make them aware of what this is doing, I, I think is, is, is quite important. So, yeah, it is. And, uh, we're, we're, you know, business and economy and, uh, fair trade, who's a producer, who's a consumer teach, learn, like all those things now come into the conversation. Cause I think about the, um, the current small percentage of stories that you hear as well, of people, you know, uh, moving away from cities. Right. And I say small percentage, but, you know, that those are, those are small indications relative to your point. Uh, not, it's not a counterpoint, but we've evolved to make work, you know, anywhere. But now if you can work anywhere, now people that are deciding to like, and they're not doing this, but have chickens on a three acre parcel of land, you know, away from the city, right? So that, that, that's a, but, but that's a very, very small amount of people um, who are, who are making those decisions or who have the option to make those decisions. But I think about that when, when you talk about the point of where does the coach come in and how do they, what do they need to know about here and how much challenge do they have in front of you with this impeding, like constant evolutionary process. Um, I think inside of that conversation, we have to talk about business, right? Because otherwise just you and I spewing out ideas that a coach is then going to get in front of someone and be like, oh, wow, you know, this is someone paying for this. 
and, the, and the, here's the fair trade back. Like I need to teach them things. And I think that's the, that's the, in my opinion, that's the sad part because I see a lot of coaches get burnt out because they don't have enough countervailing positive intention forces to go against what that client is getting downloaded to them every time they're away from the coach. And so I actually see it. I, a reason why it's sad because there's a lot of great intentions on behalf of coaches to keep like pushing, pushing against that. But a lot of clients coming in and a lot of clients consistently fall back, right? They fall back to those things, um, which, you know, I, you know, I, again, I, I, yeah, it's, yeah, I keep falling back to like, what, what, what will be, well, this is why it's sad also is, is, you know, if, if we get them like to, if we get, this is, maybe this is a question, Robbie, if, they, if we get them to the point where they know a couple of things, right? Does this become another philosophical discussion as to like, well, how much more do you keep pushing as opposed to be like, listen, we're both aware of the fact that, you know, I can't, I can't helicopter you anymore, right? I like, I know you get 36 different things said to you before you come back every Wednesday. I don't, I don't know what to do from here forward. You know what I'm saying? Like that, any, any thoughts on that for, you know, where this fits in? Because it's like a, it's like they're, they're, they're starting to build knowledge, right? We're, we're I'm a, hope you're with me. We're agreeing with that point. It's like, they're starting to build knowledge. They're starting to know more. It's like, okay, well then if you know certain things, you know, well, what's happening right now? Why, why are we, are we just spinning? You know, the whole, the whole point of this podcast is exactly that. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, Yes, I agree. Like, but it all depends on like what at what point in time we say no. And you, you have I, you and I have discussed before. Like, well, is it one year or three years? Because like, it isn't just it isn't just the saying of the knowledge, right? It is the if by no we mean something like oh, you've practiced this week after week after week for one to two years at least, and then you're like, oh, well, I don't get why we're still doing this dance. Okay, now I get that. But if it's just like oh, well, I said this to you a couple of times, and you have decades of the countervailing forces in addition to the drive-throughs and TikToks, what have you. No, I, that, that I think like, no, the knowledge is not going to be sufficient. It's going to take, you know, Repetition. week after week, after week, after week. And is that one year? Is that three years? It depends on the person. It depends on how strong the countervailing forces were, you know, were their parents uh, saying that anything you eat just is going to make you look like a horrible, do you know what I mean? Like yep. it, it depends on that person. I mean, I think we both agree no matter what, there should be an end to that process. I think we both agree it is not merely a matter of just the imparting of conceptual knowledge. Otherwise, it'd be passing a book across the table. Yeah, yeah I'd be handing pamphlets. Pamphl you and I would be dressed up in white suits with uh, red ties, uh, walking around handing out pamphlets. If you want to do a Book of Mormon thing with this at, at some point and just uh, walk around and... Uh... <laughs> Listen, I am definitely a boots on the ground activism uh, individual. Uh, so I have that, have that bend. We have to make it like I can speak the talk. I've learned well, right? I've been indoctrinated, so I know how to I know how to speak the speak the language. We'll go in and talk and talk about push-ups and liver. Sir, do you do you have a moment to talk about yep. push-ups and liver? Here's this push-ups repugnant, right? Liver repugnant. Uh, you got me, uh, you got me. All right, uh, lesson one down. <laughs> you'll live, you'll live forever. So <laughs> liver forever. Um so yeah, I mean that that part I do agree with. I mean, I also I think we would probably both agree like there is an aspect to coaching and the business which I'm I'm very much not on board with, uh, and I don't suspect you are as I either. But you know this notion of like oh I have to manufacture need you would need me you can't do this on the, your own. Cool, there are some people who can yeah. go do yeah. it. Don't yeah. talk about it, be about it. But yeah. there are lots of people who can't and don't. Mm -hmm. So what, what do we do? You know, do we just say well you know tough shit like. If someone wants help, whether it's therapy or a philosophy teacher, um, and there's someone who knows what to do to help, but they're not looking to manufacture need for the rest of the person's life, that I don't think is nefarious. I, I do think manufacturing need and manufacturing into the point where it's like, well, you constantly need me and you can never get off you know, the dependence from me. That is nefarious. That, that I would totally yeah. agree with. But yeah. if you have knowledge and the skill to help someone develop habits that they're otherwise having a really tough time developing on their own for a period of time. I don't view that as nefarious at all. No, no. It's the knowledge of teaching and learning that we're defining in there, right? So you know about teaching and learning. Okay. Well, now let's get into defining, you know, is there a timeline on it? Is there a starting point entry? What's inside? 
How is that knowledge being passed over? What are your measures to determine they're actually learning things? No, we're, I guess we're saying the same thing on that. I just, I just see it as this, I guess this philosophical question, maybe back room before we even get into coaching with anyone is just like, how much should we spend time, right? How much should we spend time if it's obvious inside of that fair trade agreement between teaching and learning that it's not upgrading? You know, it's, it's, yeah. and that's, this is where I know this to be true, Robbie, like coaches have died, right? Symbolically, but a lot of them have died with good intentions inside that system, right? So and I'm not doing this to point fingers at freaking TikTok or the high intensity model or editor. I'm not doing that, but I'm just pointing out an obvious thing that, you know, uh, was it the technical incapabilities of that coach to like stepwise the knowledge process? Maybe. Maybe, um, but I think the countervailing forces are way too high for our vision of what we want for that, for true impact. And so therefore, then it, it, you ask, well, should we, and this is not what I'm saying, should we just work with people who are willing? <laughs> yeah. See that, yeah, it's like, oh gosh, you know, maybe that's for another time, you know? Uh, what? And I think that goes into the impact question and the right. um, uh, maybe, you know, activism reformation deconstruction conversation right uh i think that's where that lays no and that's i mean that's something i've thought about many 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 times and talking to brandon about yeah i mean that's yeah i mean i you know I, if if we stay on the one end we shouldn't manufacture need and try to make someone dependent on us i i also think for the most part neither should we try to you know if someone doesn't have any interest in it cool you do you peace be with you yeah. maybe there's someone out there who can kind of reach you and you know work with people that you're willing to work with and who you know can do the process however i do very much see the objection and the counterpoint about like what do we do when the entire population seems to be less and less willing because of these countervailing forces and how can we make these broad uh impacts at the level of the fitness collective yeah so. and that's where i think the word activism comes in right it's like criticizing bad ideas or just having great conversation to her point before right like me and liver boy or something up on stage with the general public that's like okay you know just chat talk about what you know this back and forth so everyone leaves the room with like okay you know interesting points um and disagreements right disagreements and what we believe to be the beacon is of before you stop <laughs> before you, you go there on <laughs> making that happen uh, for no particular reason whatsoever uh, only for me to push broccoli. <laughs> um, I think that would be the, uh, that would be the way to go about doing it. And just personally too, before, you know, just because I think about those things, I almost seem, you know, I just feel the need to say this. I do have a bend though, pro because of my upbringing and uh, my friends that were around me and my peers and, uh, you know, my life and my life experiences, I have a bend for, and from seeing this happen in front of people, who let's just call it weren't, didn't have access somehow to this knowledge around this movement. I do have a bend for injecting the inspiration inside of those people. I, I have a more of a bend for that, i.e. wrapping our arms around quote unquote, the collective unconscious, you know, and saying, listen, this is right there in front of you. And everyone is in, you know, these forces are making you not want to see it. And I just want to let you know that it's right there. It's right in front of you. Um, so I personally, you know, that's, I have a bend for that, right? The, we'll just call it in language, the, the trodden, right? The, the, the person who didn't get the accessibility or the opportunity, the downtrodden, you know, is like, don't have the opportunity for that. Um, yeah. So oh, yeah. I mean, maybe conversation for another time, right? How did, how did, what, what is that? I think, I think the, I think we're setting up a possible future one for, um, you know, uh, changing behaviors at a big level or, uh, you know, activism reformation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I'm on board with that too. I think the place where I currently draw the line is like, if, you know, if, if someone's just like, they haven't had access to it and they need help, like, Oh, you know, love it here for it. If someone's actively antagonistic, uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Peace be with you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect uh, sentence for that one, right? Wish you uh, all the best, right? But it's not, you're not going to, your best is not going to be uh, happening here. 
speaking of uh liver boy i i just came up with the name for my uh thing that i'm gonna be i'm gonna be gustin the gizzard guy <laughs> so like gizzards what? on tiktok what's that i have a high level of vitamin a in that gizzard <laughs> yep. Gust, gustin the gizzard guy get, get two million followers higher order competing philosophies yeah. liver gizzard <laughs> yeah. let's get you two on stage hammer it yep. out joe oh, rogan's yeah. podcast um all right any uh any other final thoughts here before we before we wrap up no uh to recap i really like uh whether it was directly that way or indirectly um the the way of going about this same kind of you know thing that means a lot to me the conversation and the thoughts around approaching this this uh we'll call it this perplexing tension that happens between you know, people that come into fitness and also this tension of understanding, you know, for the coach to look at it, be like, holy cow, like, do they seriously have this competing tension? And, uh, you know, we're bringing new words to it, which is really helpful. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, again, it was a repeat occurrence of, you know, uh, you know, this, <laughs> this pause that I take before I say it, but the current culture, right. And, and, you know, and the spin and the speed and the like, it's just another highlighting moment of uh, and just being aware of it, you know, as to, as to where it plays in this particular issue and, uh, and other things. And again, it was another way for me to reformulate my actions towards bringing more people possible towards uh, the inspiring physical potential that I want people to strive towards. It's another way of doing it. So uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, and I very much appreciate the discussion as well. And I thought the, uh, you know, it's, I mean, we've talked about various things that, you know, I mean, Liberty doesn't exactly have a day-to-day -day connection to, uh, you know, the fitness coach in the same way that that this topic does. I feel like this really yes. is, is such a prevalent topic in, you know, the industry and what coaches are dealing with day-to-day. -day. And just to show that while Socrates wasn't trying to get people to eat broccoli, people have been thinking for a very long time about like, you know, rationality and emotion and how those two play together and um, how is it that one can act against their own better judgment and what do we make of this and practically what do we do about it once we figure out some way to account for it. So yeah, yeah. Great learning all in all. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks so much, James. I'll see you next time. Take care.